From the San Diego Union Tribune, this is The Conversation. I'm Abby. And I'm Luis. We know you're flooded with news, memes, and all kinds of information each day. And we know that can be a little overwhelming. But if there's one story that will get you talking, tweeting, and caught up for the day, this is the one. Hello, listeners. Welcome to a special Comic-Con edition of The Conversation Podcast. This is Abby, and I am with a very special guest, uh, someone who has been with Comic-Con for quite a while, knows everything you need to know. We're so lucky to have him here. It is David Glanzer. He is a spokesperson for Comic-Con. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, How long have you been working with Comic-Con? Oh, gosh. Um, I started as a volunteer in 1984. So you have seen this thing grow and change and been through a lot with it. Yes, and actually my first convention I attended was 1978, so I like to tell people I was an infant. (laughs) <laughs> though, though I wasn't. Uh, but it's it's grown a great deal, not only in terms of size, but scope as well. It's just a, a massive event now. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, you do hear about comic book conventions in other cities, even popping up around the world at this point. What makes San Diego's unique? Well, one of the things I always say is we're, we're, we put on the type of event we want to attend. So um, while we are a nonprofit corporation, uh, a lot of the people who uh, were with the convention at the beginning uh, are still with us. Um, and we love what we do. And, and it really is a matter of trying to put together an event that we would enjoy, that other people enjoy, a great deal of diversity, a great deal of uh, education. Um, and I think we're not always concerned about the bottom line necessarily. My president will probably kill me for saying that. <laughs> but but it's really more about the experience uh, than anything else. And, and I, I think some other conventions, and this isn't a slam on them, I think, you know, are, are either for-profit organizations or run by businesses, and they really do have to look at the bottom line. Yeah. Okay. Um, speaking of that, um, here in San Diego, we are all, we all well know Comic-Con. Uh, it's become a staple of summertime here in the city. Um, I know there is a great push to keep it here, and we have an election coming up. I wondered um, if the voters do not, uh, if the voters reject the convention center expansion, uh, what are we looking at for Comic Con in the years to come? Uh, that's a great question, and, and I really don't have an, a good answer for that. We've been able to, we knew back in 2006 that we were going to have a, a space issue. Yeah. Um, and in 2010, we actually, uh, I think that was the first year we, we actually sold out the convention center in advance and have every year since, and I think it typically tickets sell out in about an hour. What we've been able to do, because we don't have enough space, is been able to move out into local hotels and park space. So when you come to Comic-Con, you'll see that it's not just uh, the happenings that are going on inside the the facility, the convention center, but also area hotels and and park space. It's worked for us now, but even now that is is really tough and it's a challenge. There are a lot more people who want to exhibit and, and, and take part than, than we have space. And uh, we're hoping that an expanded convention center will, will alleviate a great many of those concerns. If it doesn't happen, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see if we can make this work. But it's, it's not easy and we're constantly getting pinged by other cities. But we want to stay in San Diego. We were born here and we want to stay here. So for those of you listening who aren't aware of our uh, local situation here in San Diego, we have lots of coverage of this on San Diego com. A lot of interesting questions surrounding our convention center. Um, so check that out. We may talk about that on a later podcast. But um, continuing on with Comic-Con, um, how big do you see that it could get with an expansion? It's it, That's a great question, and it's funny because we've never actually tried to be a big event. Yeah. Uh, I don't think in our wildest dreams when we first started this, the, those who first started this organization ever thought it would be the behemoth it is now. And in fact, yeah. when I started... Uh, I never thought it would be this big. Uh, when I came on staff, I thought, well, oh, maybe I'll be here for two years and you know, and see what happens and then move on. But it's really just continued to grow. And again, I think we do a good job of letting people know that there are some really cool stuff here that you may not know or consider yourself a fan of pop culture or popular arts. But you, know, you come to the convention and you'll discover maybe a movie star brought you in, but then you'll discover there's comics or gaming or costuming or toys or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's the thing that really kind of binds us together here. And um, I actually forgot your question, but that's... <laughs> I just wondered how big it could get. I well, mean, it's grown and grown and grown. Yeah, I, I think 
right now we're, we, we've had to cap our attendance. Yeah. So we're, you know, we have well over 135,000 people. We've been able to push out into the, to the city a little bit in downtown. But again, we're not looking to see how big we can be. We just want to be able to accommodate those people who want to attend. And right now with ticket sales, you know, lasting a little over an hour, I think there are probably more people who want to attend than we can actually accommodate. Okay. Um, Speaking of the more than 100,000 people who will be arriving very shortly to San Diego, um, what's new this year that they can look forward to? You know, Comic-Con is kind of like a river. I think the banks are always the same. The river, uh, the water is ever-changing. So it really depends. I mean, we have a lot of uh, movie studios and and television networks, as as we always do, comics publishers, some incredible guests. I would really... um, People who are are planning on coming, I would really have them go on to our website. Uh, I think starting next Thursday, we'll start releasing our schedule. There's an amazing amount of of really interesting programming. Um, And it changes every year. There are some... There are some things that we repeat, uh, filmmaking classes, uh, how to draw or how to write, things like that. But there's always something new and unique. And um, with over 2,000 hours of programming, there's probably something for everybody. Yeah. Speaking of that, how does Comic-Con decide what gets in, what gets, what doesn't get in? And, I mean, there are just endless options for what to go check out. How do you sort of decide what what people can see? A lot of that is done by by committee. So Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's the exhibit floor or programming, um, you know, committees oversee that stuff. And and really, we want to make sure that we have as diversified a selection as possible. So as an example, I always say for programming, if some uh, or exhibits, if somebody came in and said, hey, we have a bajillion dollars and we want to have, you know, one big booth that takes up all of one hall, uh, we'd have to say no. Mm-hmm. The money would be great, but honestly, the, the diversity of, of content on the floor is really paramount. And the same is true for programming. So we 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 instigate our own programming, and then we're lucky that we're at such a size now where people will pitch programs to us. Uh, and it's really, really a daunting task to decide what's get on, what gets on the schedule and what doesn't. Uh, we're lucky sometimes that we'll get several proposals for something similar. And then we can look at who has the the most interesting um, panelists, who has the most interesting subject, and then uh, we can choose those. Okay. Um, what? Um, but we say no a lot, and uh, you know we we know we make people not very happy. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, what What do you feel like has been working really well in recent years that you're hoping to um, continue with? Gosh, you know what. Um, <laughs> That's another great question. It's hard because I, I, I think, you know, we see how the show is made and created. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we spend a great deal of time and trying to make sure that the train stays on the tracks. I mean, from now until Comic-Con, that's really kind of what a lot of us are focused on. The planning has been done, and now it's just making sure that we can deliver a, a great show. So it, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, I think we have... We have probably one of the most amazing guest lists of any convention in the United States and maybe the world uh, of, of, of comics creators and, and fans will know who these people are. A lot of people new to, the, to the, the industry may not. I really suggest that they go to the website and check those people out because a lot of those are inspirations for, for other things that people may, may be more aware. Uh, but we have a phenomenal guest list. I think our programming is really top notch. Uh, but Probably the one thing I, I, I think we probably get right is the fact that we produce a show that a lot of people want to volunteer for. And that says a lot because we have, I think, over 4,000 volunteers over the course of the show. And the fact that they keep coming back, I think we're doing something good. What would you say is something that maybe used to be at Comic-Con but has kind of... Uh, trickled off or um, gone by the wayside. Pogs. There was something years ago, probably before you were born. There were oh, I know these. About pogs. Do you? There. I yeah. think it started in Hawaii, but there were these. <laughs> they basically were like little discs that that people said originally were like on milk bottle caps, but I don't know even if there were milk bottles back then. But <laughs> it was this huge trend. I mean, it was crazy popular. Really? And uh, two years later, uh, you just didn't see them anywhere. Bring back the Pogs, people. Bring <laughs> back 2018, <laughs> I'm looking for Pogs. Tweet me at Abby Hamblin if you're bringing Pogs to the convention center. That's so funny. I haven't thought about Pogs in years. Yeah. It's amazing. You look back over the, you know, next year we're going to be uh, have our 50th convention. And you look back at stuff that you didn't realize was 
um, just something that you took for granted. And now, mm-hmm. you know, things move so fast. I mean, entertainment, uh, instant instant information. Back in the day, um, you know, people, reporters came, uh, do a story, they would file it. Now, a lot of people mm-hmm. tweet and, and use social media right as news is breaking. Mm-hmm. So a lot has changed in the past 50 years. Do you think that that affects um, sort of what the studios, the industry, the people who want to come and present? Do you think that changes their mindset at all? Well, I think that uh, studios are very, very smart and adept at trying to figure out what it is that uh, an audience likes. Uh, I think what some people, and, and not the studio so much, but sometimes uh, reviewers or critics will miss a point, and that is, um, a, a, let's say a film comes to Comic-Con and, and gets a great reception, but the film doesn't do well. And oftentimes critics say, oh, Comic-Con was off the mark on this. And you know what? I, I really beg to differ. When you when, when anybody comes and brings a three-minute presentation that is amazing, uh, the audience is going to go crazy. But if you can't deliver that when 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 the movie comes out, well, then we're not going to go. Yeah. So it's you know, it, and I think the the good studios and good uh, networks have realized that we need to share information, not sell information. We need to if we have something really cool, we want to share that with you, and then hopefully that'll translate into people tuning in, whether it's a TV show or a movie later on down the line. A very interesting uh, thing to watch from year to year. And speaking of that, um, do you have any thoughts about Marvel, HBO? Um, some, there's a lot of chatter about how they're not going to be there. A few others. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have you know Paramount, we have uh, uh, Warner Brothers Television, we have and we have a, a, a slew of people who are coming. Uh, and not every studio comes every year. And I think those. Um, those people who, you know, uh, write stories and say, oh, maybe the bloom is off the rose or something. Well, they haven't looked at the history. And, and it's a savvy company that doesn't bring something to the fans and to the attendees because they feel they have to sell something. But will sit a year out because they don't have something they think the audience will appreciate. Or it isn't finished yet. So do I expect those companies to come back? I do. I mean, they have in the past. Uh, but the, 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 the smart ones won't come in and sell something to the audience that the audience doesn't want. And I've seen a panel like that before, and it's not a pretty sight because our people are vocal. <laughs> interesting. Very interesting. Um, so there you have it. Two questions about transportation and sort of outside of the um, convention center. Can you talk a little bit about the decision to close Harbor Drive in front of the convention center? And then also, I'm very, very curious... I tweeted about this recently. This is our first year with the dockless bikes in San Diego. And I can't wait to see the cosplayers riding around on those things and the scooters. Uh, But I noticed that Petco Park, for example, has some signs out, you know, saying don't park these near the uh, baseball park. How will uh, Comic-Con deal with those? So the the closure of Harbor Drive was something that was um, brought to us by the city and, and, and the police department. And I, I think it's uh, a combination of a lot of different things, uh, primarily security. So we always want to err on the side of caution. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I mean, they, they have a plan in place. I think if you go to the, the San Diego Convention Center website, there's an FAQ list of uh, different questions and whatnot and the parameters and maps and all that. So we'll see how that goes. Um, with regard to the, the, the dockless bikes and all that, I got to tell you, I've seen a lot more of those scooters. And yeah. those scooters whip by pretty darn fast. Yeah. I was walking across the street, and this guy just about knocked me over. Um, so I don't know how that's going to work. I, I, my understanding is with the closure uh, in front of the convention center, they won't allow any of those within that, that area. Where they're going to park and all that, I think the city is working on something for that. Um, and, and if they do, I'm sure they'll let people know. But I think they're also working with the different companies to try to let people know, you know, Beware that you may not want to be in this area, or if you are going to uh, want to come down, you know, uh, drop your stuff off farther farther out. All right. Well, stay tuned on that one, folks. We will, as soon as we hear something, I'm sure we'll be putting it on our Twitter accounts, uh, maybe online. Um, here's, a, here's a question that I also see people often talking about, a good conversation that unfolds on social media. How do you balance these big productions? I was just remembering... Um, in 2015 about the big Star Wars concert. There are some seriously huge things that unfold, especially when it comes to TV and film, but there's also the classic uh, long-standing comic industry 
um, aspects. Many of the panels with illustrators, creators, um, your classic comic book sort of um, moments at Comic Con. How do you balance sort of the Hollywood aspect of this and more of the I know you mentioned education and some of the um, industry events that go on. I, I I think you know I'll let you in on a little secret. Uh, Hollywood actually Hollywood actually makes up a much smaller percentage of, percentage of Comic Con than I think most people realize. They they have uh, deeper par- pockets, so they can actually promote themselves a lot better. Mm-hmm. So yes, um, you know Hall H typically has big studios and networks. But that's a 6,500-seat theater. So at any given time, there are 6,500 people watching that particular event. But there are arguably, you know, thousands upon thousands of other people who are are partaking in things that don't have to do with that. Um, but, you know, what? I think there is a, a balance that we strike. You know, look at our guest list again. It's pretty impressive. And one of the things that, that is... Uh, one of the, the people on staff always say that, you know, he he likens uh, Comic Con uh, to the story about the blind man and, and and the elephant. Depending upon where you touch, you may think it's a different animal, um, and that's kind of with Comic Con. It is what you make of it. If you want to uh, go see the big Hollywood stuff, that's great. If you want to see the smaller uh, um, stuff, that's great as well. I mean, I, I, you know, John Lewis. Um, had a, a graphic novel out, and it's amazing because he did this march uh, it, from uh, his panel, I think, to the exhibit floor with I kids. That, and all. Yeah. yeah, and that that's huge, incredibly yeah. moving. And yeah. I think you know that uh, when you, I think when you try to look, you know, you look at something that's a really huge um, media event or something that's intimate but just as powerful. Uh, it all happens at the show, and it's great. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, what would you say is maybe for those who have been going for years and years? Um, something that's maybe underrated, or what would you encourage people to check out that maybe they overlook from year to year? Yeah, you know what? It, it, and again, it depends upon your interest. If yeah. you're into film or comics or toys or games or whatever, what I always ask people to do is to uh, step outside of their comfort level a bit. Um, if you're always there for the blockbuster Hollywood stuff, look on the schedule of something that isn't a blockbuster Hollywood stuff, and you may find something you really like. Well, there was a reporter from uh, a, a paper in L.A. a couple years back who came down to do a story, and um, we did an interview, and, and, and a retailer had given her some comic books. And the following year, she came back, and we did an interview again. I said, oh, what are you covering this time? She said, oh, you know, actually, I was so intrigued by the comics that I got that I pitched a story about comics. So step outside of your comfort zone and experience all that it has to offer. What tips do you, or advice do you have for first timers walking in? No idea what's going on. Wear comfortable shoes. I know that (laughs) sounds silly, but honestly, stay, stay hydrated. And also there are a tremendous amount of people at the show. If you're not a person who really likes crowds, this may not be the best event for you or, uh, make sure you know you kind of plan out first, second, and third choices of what you want to do and see, um, and do that. I mean, uh, one of the great things about Comic Con is that people are friendly. I don't know that um, all of us would hang out together on any other weekend. I always like to say, but during Comic Con we do, and we're respectful, and we're all there to have a good time and and to meet friends and make new ones. So, you know, I'd say just enjoy yourself, uh, relax. Uh, stay hydrated and and, uh, be prepared to to meet a lot of people. I would totally agree. I have met some really, really nice people from all over the world, too. That is one of my most uh, favorite things about going to Comic-Con is last year I spent a little time talking to someone from Ireland, and that was just really interesting to get their perspective on it. It's so funny. There's a gentleman who's a reporter from... um, the Netherlands, I think, and uh, oh, he'll kill me if he's not from the Netherlands. But he's, you know, from Northern Europe, and it's funny because we had done interviews, and and um, I would see him every year, and sometimes we would do interviews, sometimes we wouldn't, but I'd always run into him. And then one year, uh, I, his name was Henrik. I didn't see him, and I thought, oh my gosh! And I actually did a re- uh, an interview with the reporter, and I said, this is the first year that I, I won't see him, which is kind of odd because I know he's here, and I just happened to get called off site to a meeting at a restaurant, and he was waiting in line. And he's like, hey, David. Oh. <laughs> so so hopefully this year will we'll not break the tradition. Yeah. Uh, over the years, now you've said it's been 50, and you've worked with, or next year will be 50, uh, and you've worked with Comic-Con for a while now. Um, how would you say 
I know this is really difficult to cover because there's so much that goes on, but just one example of how it has changed so much over the years. And then talk a little bit about the 50 year. Is there anything special planned? What can people look forward to about that? Well, I'll start with the 50 part first. Yeah, we have a, we have a committee. We're looking at uh, what to do. Uh, you know, we, we want to pay homage to um, the past 50 years because, again, I don't know that, A, we thought we would be around for this long and, B, that we would be as big as we are. So we're hoping that, that we'll do something that the fans will appreciate, that the attendees will have a great time uh, in taking part in. Uh, with regard to something that's really changed, I think – uh, the fact that people know what Comic Con is. When when I uh, first started, um, if I filled out a credit card application or something, I would just put CC San Diego because whenever I said Comic Con, people just didn't know what that was, mm-hmm. and oftentimes they thought it was a comedians' convention or something. We used to give away free tickets on the radio. I mean, we still do, which yeah. a lot of people don't know. But we used to give away thousands of free tickets on the radio, and the redemption rate was, you know under 100. Uh, now we don't give away so many because the de- redemption rate is 100%. So, Well, having been so involved in this for so long, I can't let you go without asking you, what has been one of your favorite moments from over the years? And then do you have any good secrets of behind the scenes that just crazy things that have happened that you can share with our listeners? Um, my favorite thing, and this is uh, going to sound cheesy, but it really is the people. Um, it's it's amazing to see people having a great time, families, uh, kids, um, people in costume. Uh, you know, it's funny. There was a, a, a report once a woman was interviewed, and, 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 and the reporter said, oh, so Comic-Con's great because you get – to come here and like be your alter ego and she said no this is who i am Mm -hmm. out in the real world that's my alter ego and i i think that's really amazing and and it says a lot about the people who attend the show um so that's that's one of the things and what was the other question i'm sorry any secrets or crazy things that have happened over the years (laughs) you know i uh i don't have any secrets really but uh, one of the the craziest things i'm a huge star wars fan the original series awesome and uh one year um william shatner had come down and he he couldn't have been nicer. And it was a period of time when I was a volunteer where we couldn't afford a lot of advertising. And he was doing uh, something for Good Morning America. So he'd come in and it would appear the next next week. And he said, is there anything I can do for you guys? I said, if you can like really push our name and our logo and all that. And he said, you know, no problem. And whenever he would do a stand-up or something, he's all, oh, to the cameraman, can we can we do this over here in front of the logo? So he was just a, a, a great guy. And... Um, when it was all said and done, you know, he met fans and everything, and we he walked back, walked him back to his car, and um, he got in his car and he drove off, and I kind of like geeked out. Yeah, I was like, oh my god, that was Captain Kirk, yeah. and you know, I held it together. Yeah. during the whole day, but when he left, I just it was it was just amazing. Do you have you had a lot of those starstruck moments over the years? You know, I worked in film for a period of time, so um, one of the things that I think is great about Comic-Con is kind of like when you're on a film set, um, you see a lot of actors' talent, and you're all – I mean, they may be these huge people making a heck of a lot more money than, you know, I ever will or any of us on on a production will, but we're all working for the same end, so – we have lunch together or we, you know, walk. I mean, you're, you're basically equals. And I think at Comic-Con, there's a bit of that. I think that when the celebrities come down, they know that we're professionals too. You know, our job really is to make sure that the fans have a great experience, make sure that the talent has a great experience. So um, uh, Starstruck moments, there are some really uh, – there are some celebrities who are even more – attractive in person than they are on camera but one of the great things is i don't think there's ever really been a bad experience with anybody they've all they've all been really really genuinely uh, genuine yeah one thing i just realized i forgot to ask you is to talk a little bit about how the convention spills out into the streets of san diego we are the san diego union tribune we can see the convention center from our office here so we like to be involved with what's going on downtown and it's really interesting to watch how the, sto- the storefronts change, there's billboards everywhere, the, um, the downtown area just transforms. So can you talk about how that has changed over the sure. years? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that we ended up having to do because we've had to limit our attendance both in terms of people through the door and exhibitors is we have to find new sources of revenue. Uh, and one of those is sponsorships. So whether it's uh, 
banners down Broadway, whether it's uh, building wraps, things of that nature, we get a little bit of money from from that on sponsorship. So that helps defray a lot of our costs. Uh, that's also. Uh, ended up resulting in there kind of being a campus atmosphere downtown. One of the things that we really try to do is whenever there's something called an, uh, uh, an experiential activation, which is a, uh, let's say a studio comes in with something outside that fans can take part in, uh, we want to make sure that um, we know what's going on, that uh, they've run stuff by us, that it's, uh, it, you know, there's no retail, stuff that ends up being uh, an added plus for the, the fans and attendees. So there are sanctioned events. There's a lot of non-sanctioned events that we have nothing to do with. We don't promote those because we just don't want to know anything about them. Yeah. But we've been able to, uh, you know, grow a bit by using those park spaces and all that. Um, how much more? I, I don't know. How much more park space or parking lots are there, I guess. Yeah. All right. The last question for you, and thank you so much for your time. This has been a great interview. Um, just want to know, what are you looking forward to about this year? Uh, gosh, that's a great question. There's there's so much. There's a, the, the, the program hasn't been released yet, but... Um, you could spoil here. No one's well, listening. Well, here, here's the problem because <laughs> I, I did that once and the program ended up getting canceled. Oh, yeah, no. which was awful because people were like, oh, where is that program? So uh, there's some programs, some small programs that I hope I can sneak into. Okay. Um, but honestly, you know, it, 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 again, we, we spending our time putting out fires. I can remember we have a sister show in Anaheim called WonderCon and a dear friend of mine who I've known forever uh, was a guest. And I was like, oh, I can't wait to see her on a panel. And um, at the end of the day, I had asked one of my assistants, I said, hey, what time is Lisa's panel tomorrow? And they're all, oh, that was like three hours ago. Oh. Yeah. So, you know what? <laughs> I, I wish there was one thing. Yeah. But it really is just the experience. Yeah. And I know that sounds cheesy and like a, a line, but anybody who's – I always say if you've never been to Comic-Con, you really should try to go once. It's it's different than the pictures. It's different than the video. It's different than somebody telling you. Uh, it really is an experience to to have. Any last things to share with the listeners? I'm sure they are hungry for good scoops and info about this year. I wish there was. I would I would stay tuned to our website, and we have a blog called the Toucan Blog. Yep. And, uh, you know, the accurate information, there's a lot of people who put out information. Some of it's non-confirmed, some of it's hearsay, some of it isn't accurate. So I would stay tuned to that, and um, I can't wait to, you know, meet, you know, over 130,000 of my closest friends in a couple of Day, a few days. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Uh, this is one of several Comic Con podcasts that we're going to be having. So if you're listening, check out the Conversation podcast, Conversation with Abby and Luis on your favorite listening app. Uh, huge thank you to David Glanzer for being here. We're looking forward to the event and uh, we'll see you out there. Well, this is fun. I look forward to coming back if you'll have me. Thank you. The conversation can be found online at sandiegounionutribune.com slash opinion and on Twitter at sdutideas. You can find me on Twitter at Abby Hamblin and I'm at Run Gomez. Find more information about our podcast including contact information at sdut.us slash conversation. This has been a production of the UT Podcast Network and thanks for listening.